Okay, um, I've just started the recording, so we will make a start. We've just gone past half past nine. Um, again, just for those who are late joining us, please can I ask that you turn your microphones off? Um, cameras can stay on or off, um, but just be aware that the session is recording. Um, and if you can please put your name and school in the chat bar, please, um, just so we can keep a record of who's come so we can let NYES know for your course certificates. Um, so good morning and welcome um, to the Designated Safeguarding Lead Network meeting um, for spring. I say spring, looking out the window, I'm not quite so sure yet, uh, for 2024. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Kat Morrison. I'm a Policy and Development Officer for North Yorkshire Safeguarding Children's Partnership. Um, as I've said, the session is recorded today. Um, we've got quite a full agenda. Um, so if we if we find that there's any questions that people add into the chat bar and we don't get round to answering them, I'll collate them and we'll make sure we send any answers out to you at the end of the session. Um, quick bit of housekeeping, I've already mentioned this. So as I've said, please just put any questions in the chat. I can see the chat bar as I'm presenting, so I'll, I'll keep an eye on that as I go along. And then just a reminder that we will record um, this morning and this afternoon session um, and they will be available on our YouTube channel. So please do um, subscribe and then you'll get notifications of all our new videos that we upload as well. OK, so um, agenda, as I've said, we've got a lot to cover this morning. Um, we will start the session off with a few partner updates. Um, you've got me, first of all. And I'll be just giving you a really quick overview of the Working Together document, um, just some of the key headlines in terms of changes and um, some of the key bits to pick up from schools. Leading on from that, I'm going to be handing over to Julie. Um, she'll kind of give a little bit of an update on some of the work in relation to the Working Together edu Education Group and the Kinship Strategy. And then Helen Smith, who's our Early Years Manager, will update on childcare and wraparound care. And then finally, we've got a couple of updates from the safeguarding unit. Um, Emma Phillips is on to give us an update um, and a bit of an ask for partners around some online safety risks. And then I'm going to give you a really quick update in relation to um, some changes, which you should all be aware of now in relation to intelligence sharing um, and our harmful sexual behaviour update. Leading on to our speakers, um, I'm really pleased that we'll be welcoming Andy Kenyon from the LADO and he's going to be taking us through some learning of LADO cases. And then we've got Joanna and Kelly, who are our school safeguarding advisors, looking at filtering and monitoring. Finally, I'm going to be looking at some local learning from cases um, and if we've got time, some national cases as well. Um, and some of that, um, that some of the implications for uh, schools and some of the learning that you can take from that from schools and just be aware there's a couple of people waiting in the lobby so i'll let those in i've just let them in cat oh thank you can you keep an eye on that because i keep hearing people pinging up yeah that'll be too. very helpful OK, so just to make a start on the working together. Um, so we had the updated version um, released in december 2023 and this statutory guidance from the, uh, the DfE sets out what organisations and agencies who have functions relating to children must and should do to help protect and promote the welfare of all children and young people under the age of 18 in England. So this 2023 edition replaces the Working Together uh, 2018, um, although there was a few kind of factual updates in 2020. And this new edition um, is really central to delivering on the strategy set out um, called Stable Homes Built on Love which outlines the government's commitment to support every child to grow up in a safe, stable and loving home. So just to give you kind of a summary of some of the key additions to the guidance, um, we've got a new chapter called the shared responsibility. Now, this highlights how positive outcomes for children depend on strong multi-agency working, and it introduces a set of multi-agency expectations for all practitioners involved in safeguarding and child protection. These expectations aim to ensure that practitioners um, share the same goal, learn with and from each other, have what they need to help families, acknowledge and appreciate difference and challenge each other. The updated guidance sets out four principles that professionals should follow um, alongside this when working with parents and carers. So these include effective partnerships and the importance of building strong, positive, trusting and cooperative relationships 
using respectful, non-blaming, clear and inclusive verbal and non-verbal communication that is adapted to the needs of parents and carers. Empowering parents and carers to participate in decision making by equipping them with information, keeping them updated and directing them to further resources and involving parents and carers in the designs and of processes and services that affect them. In relation to multi-agency safeguarding arrangements, the updated guidance has outlined new roles and responsibilities relating to the three safeguarding partners. So those of you who know our statutory partners um, are the local authority, the police and the health service. Now, the head of each statutory partner will be referred to as the lead safeguarding partner or LSP and will in turn appoint a delegated safeguarding partner or DSP. It's expected that all local education and childcare providers working with children up to the age of 18 are included in local arrangements and partners should also include um, the voluntary charity and social enterprise sectors as well. So there's been no change to education becoming a statutory partner, but the guidance is really clear that education should be a vital part of our safeguarding partnerships. And I think in North Yorkshire, it is very much a part of that. And I know Julie's going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and then finally, with regards to providing help and support and protection. So this section has been split up into three. We've got early help, safeguarding and promoting the welfare of children and child protection. For early help, there's the call to consider family needs in the context of early help and work closely with education and childcare settings. For safeguarding and promoting the welfare of children, social care assessments should consider parent capacity of both resident and non-resident parents, as well as other ad adults responsible for the child's needs. So this is including the wider network and the community and environment around that child. There's also some clarity of the role of lead practitioner and it references supporting disabled children and their carers and really kind of raises with some clarity the issue of harm outside the home um, and exploitation. For child protection, the guidance sets out a series of national multi-agency practice standards for all practitioners as well. Now, as a partnership, we are currently kind of in the process of looking at this document in a lot more depth and, and what impact it will have for practice in North Yorkshire. And we'll continue to keep you updated on that as, as we move along. Um, I've shared a couple of links um, in relation to some training or webinars you can access to get an overview of some of these trainings. I think it's really important you share this with um, your teams and your governors. Um, so the LGFL have a, a one hour session that's available tomorrow, which has got the link on the slide. Um, and I've popped the QR code on because I know that's sometimes a little bit easier for you to access so you can get booked on. Now, another webinar that's available, uh, which is pre-recorded, is about 15 minutes for, um, from someone called Andrew Hall. Now, he does a lot of kind of DSL safeguarding briefings. Um, really useful in that it discusses the document in the context of education and what it particularly means for the DSL. So, again, if you want a quick one to share with partners, you can use that one or you can always kind of play back this recording of some of the headlines that I've shared. And in terms of what to do next for schools and DSLs, um, please download the statutory guidance and the documents alongside working together um, and download the review and review the early help system guide, um, which separate, separates out all the organisations into universal services, community support, acute targeted support. Um, working together also has a really useful Appendix B, which has lots of um, useful topics and resources that again are helpful to just have printed out or downloaded um, so you can access quickly. Um, something to be considering working on is updating the safeguarding policies into the new working together document 2023 so it's not referencing the 2018 document. Um, obviously as a partnership once we've got the new keeping children safe in education we will do as we normally do and kind of go through the um, safeguarding policy updates as well. Really key, update your governors. Um, so share at the next governors meeting and really highlight some of those key changes. We've given you the resources to do that um, and continue to um, explore professional curiosity and challenge it. It's one of the things that's brought up quite a lot in working together. Um, and as a partnership, we do have guidance on this. So I've put the QR code again that will take you through to our professional curiosity and challenge practice guidance. OK, Julie, over to you. If you just tell me when to move the slides along. Um... Yeah, that's fine, Kat. Thank you very much. So um, as Kat described, we, we have the, the new working together now. 
um, and also actually Kat, the uh, webinar from the uh, the DFE went so well on the 30th. They had 700 people. They're going to announce four more dates. So we'll send them out as soon as we've got the links, guys, um, as well as the other um, training that Kat suggested. Um, but what we're doing in North Yorkshire is we've brought a group of head teachers together and other members in, in our multi-agency safeguarding arrangements to look at the wider aspects of working together. So we are calling that group of, of head teachers and multi-agency our working together group. And we're looking at how we all work together to improve school attendance, particularly myself around any child who's open to uh, children's social care. We also know we're very worried about school attendance of children with EHCP. So we're working on that with the, the group of head teachers. We're also uh, as part of that. Um, it's it's going to be probably longer than a, a task and finish group. So we'll, we'll we'll call it the working together group, but we're also targeting our work with schools around the MACE agenda. So we know there's some amazing work going on through the MACE arrangements um, and we have some wonderful training, but is it going in the right places? So that's what we're looking at. Where are the needs? And, and we're discussing that with the head teachers around MACE. And then the, the, the last thing we're working on is something that I'm doing nationally, um, but we're also starting to move towards this in North Yorkshire. And it's how we can work together to increase the voice of education in MACE and, and through um, the Safeguarding Partnership generally. And asking that question, can education be the fourth safeguarding partner? So I'm part of the DFE task. I'm leading the task and finish group around making um, education the fourth safeguarding partner. So look out for some consultations coming your way. We are beginning that work. It would mean that there will be a national consultation to see if education settings, schools, colleges do want to be a fourth safeguarding partner or whether they prefer something around um, the uh, voice of education just being um, stronger in our safeguarding arrangements. So it's a kind of watch this space. But as I say, there's a lot of work going on following the working together refresh to strengthen education voice within all of our um, safeguarding partnership. Thanks, Kat. Um, and one strategy that was released on the same day, actually, as the working together is the kinship strategy. And this is the first ever national kinship strategy. Um, and it really does establish the foundations for a future transformed kinship care system in England. And it includes commitments to launching a kinship financial allowance so that kinship carers in eight Pathfinder authorities will be paid at the same rate as the fostering allowance. It has expanded the virtual school school's role. Um, that doesn't start till September, but we'll be talking about that in the future slides. And it's renaming the Adoption Support Fund to the Adoption and Special Guardianship Fund. A lot of work around the country led us to understand that children are, who are under a, an SGO are not applying in the same way for the adoption support that's available to them. Next slide. Thanks, Kat. So the background to this is all around the goals of stable homes built on love and how to um, strengthen the, the least intervention necessary from social care. And if you've got a strong family, how can we in a safe family, how can we um, encourage and support children to stay within their loving families? Um, so. This is the, the goal and the government has invested 20 million pounds of funding to make sure that there are improvements across the kinship care sector so that kinship carers do feel supported, empowered and heard. And as part of that, there's uh, 3.8 million to expand the role of virtual schools to make sure that, that children in kinship receive the help they need in school. Thanks, Kat. We haven't had the individual local authority amounts yet, but it will probably um, equate to about half a worker um, to do this uh, advice and information role. And it, that's just a little bit about the current context of children in kinship placements. 
And what we have found is that there are some children in kinship care that are not currently captured by the existing virtual school because the children were not in care for 24 hours or more. And a lot of the stakeholders definitely felt that these children have been through the same adverse childhood experiences, that they have a special guardian and, it, and it's really equal, equal in some of the support. Thanks, Kat. So the virtual schools, it's a non-statutory duty, but from September, we will be championing the attendance, attainment and progress of all children in kinship care. So all children who have a special guardianship, it doesn't matter whether they were in care for 24 hours or not. Um, so it's a system wide approach similar to the work that we're doing now with child in need and child protection. Um, so we'll be liaising with yourselves, DSLs and also DTs because obviously it's it's a little bit of a, a strange one because we will liaise with you. Um, but the children do not at the moment attract pupil premium plus funding. So in schools, that's going to be at least one conversation that you're going to need to understand when you're chatting to special guardians. So at the moment, if a child is, is on a special guardianship, but they have not been in care for more than 24 hours, they do not attract Pupil Premium Plus, but they are attracting more support and we do need to um, you know, look on them as vulnerable learners and make sure that we're doing all we can to improve their education outcomes. OK, but you can call us for more information on that. Just call the virtual school. Thanks, Kat. So a little bit about the extended role and, and why um, virtual schools have been asked to do this, that because we really need to raise the awareness of the needs and disadvantage of the different types of kinship care arrangements and how that affects education and promote the practice that supports attendance and engagement of kinship children in education. And, and all, all children in, kin, in kinship care should be um, working together with your DSLs, DTs and virtual school and um, any other um, advice such as mental health um, to strengthen and, and address any barriers such as ad adverse childhood experiences. Thanks, Kat. So the virtual school will be very, very keen to hear your thoughts about how we can implement this and what it might look like in our schools and, and in our discussions. We already discussed it with our group of designated teachers. And again, I'd be keen to hear from DSLs on how you think it might work in your schools. And we do know that um, obviously we've got some evidence of approaches that work with 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 children um, uh, trauma responsive approaches but I do recognize that you know you don't have the pupil premium plus so it is going to be it's going to be a challenge to explain to those special guardians the differences thanks Kat so further to that, um, there are um, new government guidance for employers, or for kinship carers and how they um, can be supported at work. Um, the government are also establishing a training, information and advice offer for all kinship carers and creating a new kinship care ambassador role. And the updated um, guidance for family and friends will reflect the new status for kinship carers. And there's going to be work with the Law Commission to review legal orders and the status of kinship carers. Thanks, Kat. And I'll hand, up, hand over to Helen. Thanks very much. Hi, morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Helen Smith. I'm the early years strategy manager uh, for North Yorkshire. Um, so um, I'll just be talking a little bit, um, just raising awareness about the, the different funding stream, the different changes in expansion um, and um, and the, the changes in EYFS um, that have come in as well. Um, so currently, um, I know if you're a DSL in school, um, this might not be this sort of particular, but it, it's about the fact that knowing that you're going to have more children coming through into your schools um, that are eligible for funding. And so obviously it's that greater, um, safer, um, safeguarding issue um, in that wider context. 
So these are the funding streams currently um, that, that um, are available and the, the Chancellor in the spring budget last year announced an expansion to the to the funding. Um, so th the things that are not going to change, the next slide please, um, Kat, um, are tax-free childcare um, and universal credit for working families. Um, and so this is for, the tax-free childcare is for working families and the can claim up to £2,000 a year back towards childcare costs. The one thing that I would really point out here, and again, this is another part of your safeguarding issue, um, is that if you've got children with special educational needs, either in your early years provision or in your wraparound provision, and, and those parents are paying for anything, um, those families are eligible for £4,000 a year um, towards childcare costs. It's double. Um, so again, it's all about enabling those children to sort of ha be able to take up provision um, in your in your settings. Um, and again, the tax-free childcare, even though lots of people know about the, the universal, the £2,000, they're not aware that actually it extends right up to um, sort of 17 if the child's got a disability and it's double the amount. So please, you know, make sure that the families um, are aware of that. Next slide, please, Kat. So just for um, just a brief uh, resume, this is what's happening um, and this is how it's going to sort of affect the childcare sector um, sort of moving forwards from April um, is that working families will be eligible to claim two year, 15 hours of uh, government funding um, the term after their child is two years old. So again, you may have those children already in your provision that are paying for paying for that care um, and they they potentially will be eligible. Then from September it rolls out and it's 15 hours of uh, government funded childcare from the term after a child is nine months old um, and then from September 2025 this is sort of building on this it'll be 30 hours of funded government funded childcare uh, for all families the term after a child turns nine months old. Um, so as you can see, sort of like big, big changes there. The key thing is it's always, always the term after a child's birth date. So next slide, please, Kat. So just to reiterate, because I, th I think you'll be getting these slides. These are the term dates. You know, as soon as a child turns two, um, they're not eligible. You know, if a child turns two on the 2nd of April, they will be eligible from September. If a child turns two on, say, the 31st of March, they will be eligible when we go back after after Easter. So it's always, and again, it's the same with the nine months old cut off. If, you, if you've got nursery children in your provision from birth, um, it, that nine months old, um, it's the term after a child is nine months old. Next slide, please, Kat. And then the other part of this, um, and again, is is you know with safeguarding heads on, um, is that expansion of the wraparound care for all primary school children for parents who actually need it. There isn't any expectation that every school will have their own uh, wraparound provision in each individual school. It's about making sure what we've already got available. Have we got child minders already picking up from your school? Um, you know, are there is there a local nursery who is already doing that? But as you can see, you know, again, you know, the, there's potentially going to be a lot more children accessing, um, you know, education and care um, for a longer period of time because of this government um, expansion. So that that's the a quick resume of the expansion. Early years foundation stage. Next slide, please, Kat. So. We had a new early years foundation stage from from January. The document has been split into two different documents. There's one for group and school based providers and there's one for child minders. Um, and today for, for the purpose of this, I'll just focus on the the, the group and school based provider. Um, so obviously there was the update. It came out in the 4th of January. So please, if you're a DSL, make sure that, um, you know, in your EYFS units, in your reception, that they're using the one um, that that is the, the updated version. Um, 
And then since um, the 4th of January, there's just been some minor, minor tweaks, um, sort of more formatting um, sort of issues, uh, paragraph number changes. Um, so there's just been a couple more changes. So we'll just go on to those as well, Kat, please. Next slide. So this is just a summary of the changes. Um, so from from January the 4th, um, all group managers have got to have um, a level two mass qualification. Um, it's about ensuring your safeguarding policies and procedures include all electronic devices. So it isn't just, I mean, it used to say sort of mobile phones, but it, it's anything. It's, you know, mobile watches, you know, all, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then about paediatric first aid. Um, the paragraph changes that this affects are sort of 3.40, 3.41, 3.62 um, in the statutory framework. Um, and then <clears throat> next slide, please. And then the this is what schools um, and school based sorry groups and school based provision may wish to consider. Um, and we've got the level three practitioners. Um, about level two mass qualification, about students um, and about developing um, sort of their home language in their play and learning. So that's been changed. And then the other changes. Next slide, please, Kat. Um, is um, that what you should be aware? And again, this is all in the statutory framework. Um, so and the one thing that we always say in safeguarding is Try not to print off the documents. I mean, certainly in the safeguarding, I know it's handy to have the, the EYFS statutory framework there, there, but it's making sure if you've got a printed copy that you're sort of annotating it to make sure that you've got the amendments in as well. Um, so again, these are changes. The other changes were specifically sort of section three, um, and then this, this has got about your language in section two, your statutory assessment points, which as we know in EYFS, it's your two year old assessment point and and at the end of reception. Um, and then just a quick um, just I mentioned about um, I said that we would talk about pants. We did a fantastic presentation. Um, the um, NSPCC came to the masterclass in autumn and did a fantastic presentation on the pants campaign. If you've not accessed that, I, I would encourage you to go onto the NSPCC website. I'll pop it in the chat afterwards and look at the pants campaign. Um, they, they were updating lots of information, lots of resources, and it's all there just about and you know how you get those messages across to children um, about, you know, sort of what what's in their pants um, sort of, you know, belongs only to them um, and keeping children safe in that respect. Um, the masterclasses, the early years masterclasses, they're all recorded. They are all available um, on our safeguarding um, sort of YouTube site. And I know I've said I've uh, sort of shared them in key messages as well. Um, and our next early year safeguarding masterclass is scheduled for the 16th of May um, in the evening um, to sort of enable as many um, early years practitioners um, and staff in schools to actually access it. Um, and so that that's me, Kat. Thank you very much. Okay, Emma. Super, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name's um, Emma Phillips and I'm Head of Safeguarding Partnerships for North Yorkshire Council. Um, and just want to um, raise um, awareness really around some um, challenges around online exploitation um, and to seek some support from um, colleagues in relation to how we respond as a partnership to some of these challenges above and beyond what we already currently do um, and to seek some support from schools in terms of getting some of that feedback. Um, next slide, please, Kat. So I wanted just to draw attention to um, some of the latest data coming out from the Internet Watch Foundation in relation to the child sexual abuse material that they're identifying on the Internet and that they're taking down. Now, they've seen a significant year on year increase in indecent material being identified online and they found it's grown quite considerably since COVID. In 2023 alone, they received over 392,000 reports of child sexual abuse material, of which over 54,000 were what's known as Category A images. So that's the most severe type of abuse, so ranging from penetration of children, bestiality, sexual torture. 
275,000 of those confirmed to show child sexual abuse within those imageries. Now, what's most concerning is that 92% of all the web pages that they took down, so the Internet Watch Foundation will proactively take down um, child sexual abuse material. You can also report to them. Children can report um, images to them as can member of the public. Um, but they took action to remove 92% of those web pages because they contained what they call self-generated images or videos where a child had been <clears throat> coerced or they've been blackmailed or tricked or groomed into performing sex acts via a webcam. So that might be through their mobile phone, it might have been through their gaming device, anything that has a web enabled camera. So that material, once it had been um, uploaded, had then been shared widely by criminals on dedicated child sexual abuse sites and forums. Now, most concerningly, that in 2023, the imagery involving children under 10, so those that are in our primary schools and our early years provision, featured in over 10,000 of those web pages um, that contained the self-generated imagery. And they found this is a 66% increase on the material that they found in 2022, um, which contains over 64,000 URLs containing that. Next slide, please, Kat. So having a look at what that looks like in terms of what we know from our growing up in North Yorkshire um, information. So um, we know that this is a, a significant challenge um, from some of the work we've done just recently coming out to um, speak to schools as part of our safeguarding um, schools audit. We're hearing from schools that this is a real challenge and it seems to be getting younger in terms of some of those challenges for our young people. So our Growing Up in North Yorkshire survey showed us that in year two, 60% of pupils who go online say they know how to keep themselves safe on the internet, but equally 21% of them also said they had friends online that they don't know in real life. By year six, 33% of pupils reported never being supervised on the internet, nor having any parental controls. In year eight and year 10, 11% of pupils reported that they worry about feeling pressure from social media, either often or all of the time. And 62% of students in year eight and 10 reported taking part, at least occasionally, in one gambling related activity in the last year. Equally, between eight and 11% of the children that we looked at um, have been bullied online. And crucially, these last two images kind of relate to some of the data that we've just looked at for the Internet Watch Foundation. So 41% of Year 10 students have received nudes or semi-nude images alongside 23% of our Year 8 students. Now, 23% of Year 8 students is incredibly high. Um, that is a real concern for us. And 11% of Year 10 children have then sent undressed or sexual images of themselves online. Next slide, please, Kat. That's moving. Thank you. Um, so what we're really interested in is there is an awful lot of work. There's lots of uh, resources on our Safeguarding Children's Partnership website. Um, we know that schools are doing lots of work in this area. There's lots of work being done through PSHE. There's lots of work being done with parents, but we're really keen to try and hear some of that feedback about the effectiveness of some of that. And crucially, what is the best way for us to respond as a partnership and how do we engage best with parents and carers and guardians? So what are they telling us that they're worried about and how do we best um, target them? I know historically we've done a lot of um, evening sessions. We've tried to target parents and carers to raise awareness, but we're really keen to hear from firstly from um, children, young people about what they're most worried about and what's most impacted for them, but crucially for parents and carers as well. So the ask is um, I've had a couple of offers from, from some fantastic schools um, already in terms of just supporting this. The ask, um, if you wouldn't mind just changing to the last slide, Kat, um, would just be to take part in a, in a bit of a task and finish group initially that we will set up and we will coordinate um, just to, to work with schools to, to kind of engage with yourselves to get some of that feedback from young people and from parents and carers so then we can feed that into some of our planning work as a, as a partnership about how we tackle this. So I've put my email address um, on the um, slide for you. Obviously, we'll send these slides out so you can have some of that data. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, if you can put them in the chat, I can respond to them um, there. But thank you. Um, and I really look forward to working with some of you um, on this. I think it's quite a, a crucial issue for, for all of us in terms of tackling some of these harms to our young people online. Thanks, Anna. Um, just following on from um, 
Emma's update. I just wanted to give you a, a really key and very quick update in relation to the sharing of intelligence. Now, hopefully you will have all got this through. We did quite a push on it before Christmas, but it's always worth a reminder. Um, and it's in relation to kind of the update of the intelligence sharing tool. So we know that the sharing of intelligence is such an important tool for disruption of abuse and exploitation against young people across the county. And the Community Partnership Intelligence online portal is a key and safe way to share that information. So when we're talking about information and intelligence, we're talking about concerning incidents, suspicious activity, those unusual exchanges, something that makes you as a professional feel uncomfortable. Um, and just keep in the back of your mind what Emma's just talked about, you know, and think about the context of the online spaces where young people are spending their time and may be subject to harm and the intelligence that you can share around that that's just as vital as the intelligence around the physical places and spaces that young people are spending their time. So this portal um, is a safe um, and direct way for professionals to share that intelligence and information with North Yorkshire Police. Obviously, it doesn't supersede safeguarding referrals and you would follow your usual safeguarding procedures if um, if you had a concern around a child. But the update is that now we've um, got this online form, whereas previously, I'm sure many of you have, have submitted intelligence before. It was a, a PDF that you would have to download um, and then upload and email securely. This is now a, a click of the button, takes you straight to a portal where you can submit your intelligence. Um, and it's so quick, you know, we've had partners do it in five, 10 minutes um, through a meeting. Um, so this this is the key change. I would ask you all to kind of share this widely amongst your um, staff teams. I've put in the link um, already a, a link to a guidance document that we've put together. So this has got some really kind of key frequently asked questions around the sharing of intelligence um, that, again, you can kind of have on your staff notice boards. It's those questions of when do I share it? How do I share it? What do I share? I only know a little bit. Is it worth sharing it or do I need to wait? So it kind of covers all of those little bits for you um, and it's really quick and easy. But the um, QR code was available for you there. And then um, just the final update from me is in relation to the harmful sexual behaviour strategy and the ongoing work around the audits that's been done as a partnership. Um, so as a safeguarding partnership, we've identified the need to develop a multi-agency strategy for identifying and responding to harmful sexual behaviour and addressing this from the early identification stage through to supporting young people within the criminal justice system. Our shared aims are to ensure we have an overarching harmful behaviour strategy, harmful sexual behaviour strategy, sorry, that meets the needs for all children and young people, their families and practitioners right across the county. Um, we need to start by having an understanding of the prevalence of harmful sexual behaviour with a plan to develop a single integrated approach on how we manage this. Um, and we need the support of practitioners in how we work with children and young people to educate them around harmful sexual behaviour in order to prevent incidents. And we need that shared language and shared assessment tool for how to talk about it, recognise it and respond to it when it does happen. So for those of you who've been invited to complete the audit, um, you will have received an email with instructions and timescales. Uh, the deadline for submission um, for the audit is the 9th of February. And the NSPCC will then collate that information and analyse the results. Those of you not completing the audit, we still very much need your involvement in the process and would like to extend an invite to everyone here to attend the audit feedback session, which will take place on the 20th of March at 9.30. Um, so again, if anyone wants an invite for that that hasn't received an invite, please pop your name in the chat and I'll make sure that that comes across. So as a starting point, we've asked um, a cross section of partners and relevant agencies to be included in that initial um, audit. So it hasn't just gone out to schools, it's gone out to a wide range of partnerships as well. Um, and it's been done to kind of really help us get an understanding of the current picture of harmful sexual behaviour in North Yorkshire in order to um, ensure that we develop the best strategy for young children and young people. Um, so the launch events were recorded and are available on the NYSCP YouTube channel. Um, as I've already said, please keep a lookout for that learning event on the 20th of March. Um, even for those of you who were not asked to participate in the audit, um, the launch event videos on the YouTube uh, channel are actually really helpful resources for learning around harmful sexual behaviour anyway. So yes, there is a little bit of kind of explaining around the audit process, but there's some fabulous case examples that you can use 
use in your in your team meetings or learning sessions just to kind of get staff teams to have a greater understanding around harmful sexual behaviour as well. OK, so I'm going to hand over to Andy. Have we got Andy on the call, Emma? Have you seen him? Not yet. Just bear with me a second. Ah, yes, I think he is. Ah! Yeah, just, just yeah, arrived. Perfect timing, Andy. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Andy. Um, if you can just tell me when you want me to move across on the slides for you, but then we are ready when you are. Ah, right. OK, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, presentation normally takes an hour, but I've got half an hour, so I've narrowed it down a little bit and um, I'm just concentrating on some of the main points around Lado. So, um, OK. Uh, Move on, Kat. Thanks. OK, so obviously, I guess some people will. Oh, hang on, Kat, you've jumped. Oh, thank you. Sorry, just uh, obviously um, some people will have fairly regular contact with Lado and some um, have maybe not had any contact with the Lado. Um, so I'm just a, a freshen, freshener for everybody really around the role of the Lado. Um, and then uh, we'll just touch on some learning points. So uh, I suppose this is our um, big thing is uh, the Lado does not have an investigatory function. OK, it's a common misconception that we uh, investigate allegations we do not um, our role is managing having oversight of individual cases provision of advice and guidance to employers and voluntary organizations liaising with the police and other agencies involved and monitoring of cases to make sure they are dealt with as quickly as possible and it's a consistent and thorough and fair process and to ensure that there is an outcome. And what happens if a person resigns or is uh, ceased to be used, that there is still an ongoing process and conclusion. Okay, Kat. Okay, so what is an allegation? This is defined uh, as where behaved in a way that is harmed or may have harmed a child. OK, please don't get this uh, confused with um, obviously children's social care and significant harm. It's a lower threshold. Uh, so this is behaved in a way that's harmed, may have harmed a child, may have harmed a child is quite uh, wide. Um, uh, and it can be uh, open sort of allegations up to many areas really but it's something that uh, you know we need to consider uh, possibly commit criminal offense against or related to a child um, yeah yeah behave towards a child or children in a way that indicates he or she may pose a risk of harm to children um, it obviously could be one significant piece of behaviour or it could be uh, several uh, episodes of behaviour that leads us to uh, consider that. And fourth, this has been in a couple of years now, but behaved or may have behaved in a way that indicates it may not be suitable to work with children. And that is uh, examples of um, outside of, of their role um, and could be within their private life. Um, we sort of consider domestic violence, sexual, physical uh, assaults against or related to an adult. Um, and it, these are allegations not distinct from a complaint and therefore dealt with under NYSCP procedures. OK, so possible cases. The allegation is in direct relation to their current role. 
um, allegation in relation to their own child. Um, if their child's under a ch ch child protection plan. Um, then obviously professionals have considered that that child is at risk of significant harm. And therefore we need to consider whether their role working with children is manageable. Um, that's not directly our decision. That's going to be down to the employer. Um, but that's something that uh, needs to be considered. Um, and that does happen. We've had um, head teachers uh, who have been in that position. Um, so it can happen to anybody. Uh, allegations in relation to other work, volunteering with children, sports coach, scout, scouts, guiding. Um, so if there is an allegation, either in that role or in another role working with children, we will consider all the roles where that individual works with children. Um, so uh, obviously we're considering safeguarding children across the board there and we'll liaise with the safeguarding team for scouts or uh, that organisation. We also have uh, non-recent allegations where their current role is working with children and reported abuse occurred over one year before. We, again, we need to consider their current role and inform the current employer if we're made aware. And also when we are uh, involved and we might do police checks, uh, we can uh, obtain information that is not on the DBS and that needs to be shared post employment. Um, obviously the DBS uh, is a piece of paper that states that that individual has nothing current uh, that prevents them from working with children. Um, it isn't saying that they are safe, it's just saying that they, uh, there is no record um, that police are going to disclose. However, um, there can be uh, information on that individual's uh, police file uh, that is shared with us, uh, ne didn't necessarily meet the DBS uh, threshold to share, um, but it's considered by ourselves. Uh, and again, we need to consider whether there's any transferable risk. Okay, Kat. Okay, <laughs> suspension. Uh, we say always a last resort. Shouldn't, obviously, it's always going to depend on the seriousness of the allegation. And if it's significant, then it's something that would be considered fairly early on. However, uh, what we are considering is, is of course, to suspect a child or other children are at risk of significant harm or the allegation is so serious that there may be grounds for dismissal. Um, and also can be considered where it is necessary to allow any investigation to proceed unimpeded. Um, again, these are considerations that we need to discuss uh, at the outset. Uh, we will bring in HR for advice as well. Um, uh, and uh, again, uh, circumstances are different. Uh, we're look, trying to ascertain is there any other area we can, can they work from home? Can they work uh, away from children? Um, or can they be supervised working with children? There's many different options um, for us to consider. Next one, Kat. Obviously, if police are uh, dealing with the case, then police uh, will take priority with their investigation. Uh, if it, police aren't going to be investigating, then we need to consider following steps. Uh, who's going to investigate? Who's the best person? Uh, and we're thinking about uh, you know, who can investigate have we still got people, sufficient people to sit on a panel and a review uh, appeals panel? Um, who interviews the children? Again, considering the best person, could it be the class teacher? Uh, obviously, if the allegation isn't against that class teacher. Um, 
uh, you know, who is the most appropriate? It might be someone with a rapport with the children. Um, who hears disciplinary cases and appeals? How is gross misconduct defined within your organisation? And what HR and legal advice support will you access? Um, obviously, for schools, bigger organisations, HR, legal advice is pretty much there. For smaller settings, uh, that's maybe something that you buy in or it's not something that you have actually uh, readily available um, and it's something that we would advise that you consider um, because these uh, allegations can often come at inopportune times. And we need to ensure that the school process will be followed to completion. Uh, and that is obviously at the end of the day, the uh, um, role of LADO is ensuring that these uh, allegations are not, for want of a better word, swept under the carpet um, and that there is a conclusion. If the individual does uh, resign or leave their post, uh, that is not the end of the process. The process will continue. Uh, school the employer will be asked uh, should they what would they have done had the individual not resigned and we will still reach a lado outcome um so yeah okay thanks cat okay lado outcome uh, i've split this side uh, this slide now um what i say to when I'm giving talks to teachers uh, or other groups is, um, you know, if there is a allegation against you, you know, I can't, or the LADO can't take away the pain that that can cause at the initial outset. Um, and if it is substantiated, uh, obviously there's means that there's enough evidence to prove the allegation. So just concentrating on the substantiated allegation. So if the subject is not dismissed, but the allegation is substantiated, the employer is advised the allegation will be referred to in any future reference by the employer. And the employer will be advised how long to retain, retain that uh, uh, information. So what that does mean it's a sub, it does, does not mean the subject cannot work with children in the future. But if they do go for another role working with children, that that substantiated allegation must be referred to. Secondly, subject, the allegation is proven and the subject is dismissed or removed from regulated activity then the employer is informed to submit a referral to DBS and any other relevant regulatory body, be it TRA, Teachers Regulation Authority or GMC. Uh, and those decisions by the DBS or regulatory body are separate processes. Um, I don't find, or LADO doesn't find uh, the outcome uh, of a DBS process. Uh, we're not automatically informed. If we have reason to, we can submit a legitimate interest request. Um, but we will feed into that process. DBS will write to us for information. They'll also write to police if they were involved and the employer uh, and they'll collect their information. Um, but that decision. Um, so if you are asked if the subject is dismissed, and you are asked to make a referral to DBS, you are not making a decision uh, that the individual should be barred. Your duty is to submit the referral for DBS consideration. OK, I hope that's clear. Um, we'll move on, Kat. OK, the other outcomes. Um, in essence, what I say um, 
whilst you, the individual may have gone through the LADO process, these outcomes to some extent protect the individual. Um, so the other outcomes, the allegation can be unsubstantiated, sufficient evidence to prove or disprove the allegation. It's unfounded. There's no evidence or proper basis supporting the allegation. It's false, there's sufficient evidence to disprove the allegation, or it's malicious and there's sufficient evidence to disprove that allegation has been a deliberate act to deceive. If for teachers, the allegation is found to be malicious, that can be removed from the teacher's record completely. Um, however, the, the those outcomes the employer will be advised there is no need to refer to those in any future reference. Uh, if the employer will receive written guidance from us uh, in respect of that. Those LADO decisions are made at the end of the employer's process. Okay, they don't, they're not made to influence the outcome of the employer's process. They are there. At, at the completion of the process. Well, that is clear. Okay, that is in a nutshell the ladder process. Um, I am doing a masterclass tomorrow at lunchtime, uh, and normally I spend about an hour on this. Um, so I've taken a few slides out so that I'm, I'm moving on to sort of lessons that. As, as LADOs have learned uh, and we want to bring to your attention. Um, but I hope that those who aren't in, don't use the system regularly, that that does explain it. Again, if you've got any questions, either ask them now or at the, uh, you can email me or the LADOs. What we always say is if you're in doubt, consult with the LADO. We operate a duty LADO process. Um, one of us is uh, on duty Monday to Friday. Um, and that duty ladder will deal with your query or the allegation. And what happens is uh, at the end of the day, if, if it's an ongoing allegation, it will be sent to the ladder that covers. Uh, we're split into three areas. My colleague Marie Petman covers the western half uh, or third. Uh, Julie Kay covers the east and I cover central, north and central. Um, and we'll manage it in a, a long term process. So lessons learned. Um, picked out uh, a few. Um, so when there is an ongoing police investigation, the organisation will be contacted to share information. And this should be done without delay. Um, um, we're bringing this uh, to people's attention because people become concerned about sharing information. Oh, we can't share that information. It's private to the individual. Um, there are the general data protection, GDPR, data protection, human rights laws are not barriers to information sharing, but provide a framework to ensure that personal information about individuals is shared appropriately. Um, we have, in certain circumstances, um, had uh, employers refuse to share any information that's necessitated taking fairly drastic steps at, in some cases. This is safeguarding uh, and if there's ongoing police investigations, then there's a duty to share. Um, obviously, if in doubt, please consult but it should not uh, prevent the sharing of information. Please don't, don't just automatically hide behind it. Um, low level concerns, individual that individually may not meet the threshold for LADO and should, should be managed within appropriate internal procedures. A series of low level concerns may indicate a pattern of behaviour that might indicate the person is unsuitable to work with with children and should be discussed with the LADO. Again, I can't give you hard and fast examples. Um, I am currently dealing with uh, an individual 
who was involved with five different organizations and all of those individual uh, organizations without question have had low level concerns uh, one of them should definitely have referred to lado um, however the other four um, had, did have low level concerns um, and they uh, appropriately didn't necessarily share them but we've now built a bigger picture but i think if you're getting two or three potential low level concerns that are of a very similar nature um it may be something that you review um it may be recorded on cpoms or other documentation um but again it you know again i'll just come back if in doubt consult with us if you don't ignore them either um that's what we're saying Okay, Kat. Again, these are from uh, things that we've dealt with over the uh, last few years. Organization staff and volunteers are aware at induction and or within a code of conduct that behavior outside of work and our relationships with others may bring in their question suitability to work with children. And again, we're talking about the fourth category here, other behaviours um, that may mean they're a risk of harm to children. So domestic abuse, um, concerns that someone they're closely associated with may present a risk of harm to children. And other behaviours that may be in the um, public domain, social media, uh, we, <laughs> Um, probably showing my age here, but you know some of the things sort of younger teachers, uh, younger employees put on social media these days. You know, it probably may be more natural to them, but you know it's it's a thing that should be discussed at induction, and they should be well aware that behaviours outside may affect their role within the organisation. Um, one of the things that, you know, safeguarding a regular monthly, when you have your regular staff meetings, be it monthly, quarterly, you know, these are the type of things that should be discussed, staff reminded of. Um, you know, I would like to see, you know, I think safeguarding should be a standing ad agenda, um, you know, and reminders discussed openly as well. Uh, with staff, so they're absolutely clear and reminded as the year goes on um, of these types of uh, issues. I've already touched upon the role of LADO is not to investigate. However, LADO will challenge if they feel the investigation has not been sufficiently thorough or if they feel the outcome is not appropriate. Um, at the end of the day, it is the employer's decision uh, on what they t what action uh, their outcome. Um, however, you know if we do feel that uh, it's inappropriate, then we will challenge. Uh, I've certainly done it recently, challenged an organisation, um, and following quite a bit of back and forth, they have reviewed their decision um, and taken a more serious sanction. Uh, it's quite rare, uh, but it is something that we will consider. Uh, we also may well consider other regulatory bodies um, such as Ofsted, Charity Commission or commissioning if we feel it is appropriate. I can't. This is my uh, final slide. Um, I'm going to this area here, behaviours can be conducted openly in front of staff, pupils, parents, suspicious, unacceptable behaviours should be challenged appropriately. I'm going to cover this in more detail tomorrow uh, in the LADO masterclass, but don't ignore open, blatant behaviours that 
it may be well you might think why are you doing that that shouldn't be happen happening um you know the example i'm going to give is a real example that we came across which was a teacher giving driving lessons on the school playground uh the head teacher having children to his own home uh head teacher using schools to uh using ex pupils to paint parts of the school um do work on the school roof it's it, it was open in front of everybody um but nobody challenged challenged it so it, again it's just reminding the staff that any unusual behaviors should be challenged or concerns raised with the appropriate uh persons obviously if it is the head teacher then there is you know your role as tsl you may well be contacted or, or above that it's a governor's or school advisor um but you know don't be afraid to challenge such behaviors uh, and safer recruitment, uh, you know, be confident uh, the staff are, who are involved in safe recruitment are appropriately trained. Is the school process thorough and robust? Um, again, we're currently dealing with uh, a case where, you know, safer recruitment wasn't uh, followed and the you know there were there were opportunities where you know had it been followed the individual may not well have been recruited uh on that note i am doing some safer recruitment training uh which starts in april so keep your eyes open for that because that's going to be advertised um so uh, i should become a salesman shouldn't i uh so uh really uh as we say if in doubt please consult um and uh, the final slide uh susan crawford for those of you who know and who we all uh, relied on has retired um so we are slowly recovering from the loss of susan um and we're just waiting for the appointment of a new Lado manager. Um, Duty Lado, uh, phone number is there, 01609 533080, and the address lado at uh, So, any questions from anybody? Thanks, Andy. Um, nothing in the nice. chat at the minute, but I'll I'll keep an eye on it if anyone puts anything up. Um, anything at the end, I'll collate as well for you, Andy. Um, right, I'm going to hand over to Joanna and Kelly, who are your safeguarding advisors. Um, ladies, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, so Joanna and I are going to just talk to you briefly about filtering and monitoring. Um, we're both safeguarding advisors for North Yorkshire uh, and we travel across the whole county supporting schools with their policies and procedures. So we thought today it'd be quite good just to sort of go over the areas that were in the Keeping Children Safe in 2023 document. This, this was in obviously previously, so you will have had your filtering and monitoring in place prior to September 2023, but there have been elements that have changed slightly, so we thought we'd go over those today. Thanks, Kat. Yeah, you can move to the next one. Thank you. So obviously with the, the changes in keeping ch keeping children safe in 2023, so it's now sort of the standards are to support schools to meet their duty to have appropriate, effective filtering and monitoring systems in place. Um, and schools should be doing all that they reasonably can to limit children's exposure to the online risks via schools devices and the schools network IT system. So we talk a lot when we go and support schools 
um, around what, what they've put in place in order to make sure that their filtering and monitoring uh, is working. Obviously, there's different providers out there. If you're with NUS Digital, obviously, it's smooth wall. So often conversations are around that. But obviously, depending on your, your situation, your school, you might be signed up with a different IT provider. Thanks, Kat. So there is sort of new responsibilities for, for yourselves as DSL since um, September 2023. So it's your role now and your responsibility for understanding the filtering and monitoring systems in, in place in your settings. So we've just referred to those from the from Keeping Children Safe, paragraph 103, page 28. Something that um, not all schools are aware of is that it needs to be in your DSL job description as well. Um, so if this isn't the case, then we would advise that you make this as part of your your job description. So it's really clear as to exactly what your what your role is around filtering and monitoring systems. Thank you. Now, with anything related to safeguarding, um, we, we often talk about, you know, cases that are upsetting. So I just want to sort of give you a bit of pre warning here. So if anybody you know, is upset by the case study that we're about to share, please, you know, have some time out. We understand that totally. Um, and how, however often Joanna and I share these case studies with with schools, um, you know, it's still very upsetting, you know, to talk about these these particular cases. But we do feel it's important because I think it really sort of brings home the importance of why we need to make sure that the filtering is in place in schools and why we monitor. So this particular case here um, is around um, a young girl called Frankie Thomas, who unfortunately took her own life when she was 15. Um, the inquest, which, you know, sort of the, the sort of outcome of the inquest showed that she had been accessing um, inappropriate material around self-harm and, and suicide at her school where she where she was. Um, the school thought they had their filtering um, in place, but it wasn't working. So what she'd been accessing um, over a, a new, numerous days um, on school, iPads, laptops, she then took her own life following the last story that she'd read. Um, which is really upsetting. So we are going to watch a short clip now. And again, it is upsetting. Her mum and dad are interviewed in this. So like I said, if you need to take time out, that's fine. Thanks. If you just play the next clip, Kate. Thank you. A gifted musician, funny, quirky, kind, intelligent. These were just some of the words used to describe Frankie Thomas in court today. Well, she's kind of a typical teenager in a way, pretty quirky. She was really kind as well. She said, Dad, I think I'm going to be a session musician when I grow up. And at the age of 14, coming up 15, doing really well with bass guitar. I could believe that as well. Diagnosed with autism, she attended Stepping Stones, a special needs school in Surrey. It was here that she looked up stories about self-harm and suicide on the day that she took her own life, age 15. Hours later, her mother found her unresponsive in her bedroom. The method of suicide the same as in the last entry she had read. Today, the coroner said the material Frankie was accessing that day more than minimally contributed to her death. We heard that she spent two hours and 20 minutes with unfettered access to the internet on an iPad that her school should have been monitoring closely. This, she said, was a serious failure on their part. It's not an exaggeration to say it tore us apart. I'm not very good at holding this together. Frankie was vulnerable. She had some special needs and she didn't even have a laptop at home. And to find out what she was accessing or what she was able to access freely. On school equipment, at school. Was horrifying and it was devastating. The platform that Frankie found these stories on is called Wattpad and I'm on it right now. Within minutes I've managed to access plenty of material relating to self-harm, uh, to sexual violence, to suicide, even though according to my profile I'm just 14 years old. Uh, it describes itself as a global entertainment company but it's user-generated content so that means anyone, you or I, could post a story and there are over a billion up there right now with just 600 moderators filtering the content. We put this to the company and they told us they developed robust policies and processes to ensure the trust and safety of all their users. 
It's yet another startup that's blown up into big business, acquired by a South Korean conglomerate with an annual revenue of $5 billion. The same month, incidentally, that the UK government published a draft online harms bill. That's law which it says will police social media companies. One of those scrutinising it now before it comes into force is Baroness Kidron, who wrote the government's current digital privacy code for children. It's such a fine line between one platform being shut down, another springing up. They all operate in different jurisdictions. How on earth, as one country with one bill, can we police this? Well, I think there's two things to say here. First of all, you know, I introduced the Age Appropriate Design Code into law a few years ago. It came into being this summer, and we've seen huge changes right across the globe from the big platforms in relation to one code, one country. So I think that that lack of optimism is, is not justified. I think we're going to see change. This is, this is really tech's tobacco moment, and I think let's start again the era of self-regulation is over they can't be trusted we need regulation the law isn't expected to come into force until the end of next year for now frankie's family are continuing the fight writing to the us and uk governments trying to navigate a complex web of international tech law to stop their own child's story recurring we just think we're doing what we can now and um, eventually we will think now what we never, ever, ever forget Frankie. We think about her every day. But we need to move on as well, eventually. Yeah, and to honour her with whatever else we do in our lives. We want to honour her so that she'll be proud of us, whatever we do next. And if you've been affected by anything in that report, you Thanks, can get Kat. support by going to the Kat. website. OK, so, I mean... The gift of musician, you. funny. Thank you for watching that, because obviously, you know, like I said at the, the, the start, it is a really hard watch. But I think it's the message Joanna and I wanted to get across by sharing that with you today is how important it is to test your filtering is actually working. And that's something we'll talk about on a, a slide in a, in a couple of minutes. Thanks, Joanna. Well, thanks, Kelly. So, yes, so really what it did reinforce in that video, like I say, is a, ter a, ter a terrible watch, really. But this is just not a school issue. Um, this is um, like they said in the in the short clip there. It, the online issue is for, for everybody to take part of, isn't it? Organisations, the government parents. So, like I say, the government has introduced the online safety bill. So this will set out laws to protect children um, online and it will make um, social media companies and platforms more responsible for their, their users to ensure that they are safe on these, these platforms. So, so there, there will be more. So like I'm saying, this isn't just a focus on, on schools. Um, but the DfE have put the digital and technology standards referred to as the filtering and monitoring standards together um, to kind of support schools to make sure that children and other education settings, that children are safe while they're in school on, online on those devices. So I'm going to talk you through um, the four standards. Um, so within that document, they have set these four standards for education settings to work to. So the first standard is that all settings must identify and assign roles and responsibilities to meet filtering and monitoring standards. Within that, they, like Kelly just said, they need to review the filtering and monitoring provision to ensure that it's in working order. Within that, they need to make sure that those filtering systems are blocking harmful and inappropriate content and that there's effective strategies in place to safeguard children and monitoring and to monitor those processes. So the link there is there for the digital standards. It's not an onerous document. It, it's quite set out on specific roles and responsibilities uh, for each part uh, of an organisation, in, including setting out the technical uh, responsibilities. So next cat, cat, um, slide, please, Kat. So first, the first standard, the roles and responsibilities um, around ensuring the standards are met. So the governing bodies uh, of your organisation need to ensure that they've got overall strategic responsibility for filtering and monitoring. Um, and that also sits with your leader, uh, senior leadership team. So that might be the designated lead uh, within all, some organisations, or there might be another member of the senior leadership overseas um, online safety in school. So they need to be to be working together. 
So they need to ensure that they've procured a system and it's it's fit for purpose. And that's where your IT provider comes in place, that they are responsible for the technical requirements to make sure that that, that system is in working order, that, like I said, before it fit for purpose, that it's, it's um, monitoring um, the filtering and uh, mon monitoring system within it. Uh, that you're getting regular reports on how that system is working. And if you highlight any concerns, they address those uh, those concerns. The role for the designated lead is, again, like Kelly said, it's about that overall oversight of having responsible for safety, safeguarding, including online safety. And they need to ensure that they are receiving filtering and monitoring reports about that system to ensure that it is in that working order that they receive alerts on the system where actually there has been breaches um, to the filtering system or by ch users on the system. So that could be children or staff. And then they review that and address any safeguarding concerns and follow those up and ensure that they are checking that filtering monitoring system is in working order and ensuring that all staff um, and pupils um, are aware of that system and that staff are aware of their roles and responsibilities when children are using online devices uh, within that setting. So it's just not with one person this, it's not with the IT provider or the designated lead, it needs to be a whole approach, a strategic and operational approach, um, as a whole school approach to make sure it, sure it is in working order and in, in place. So next um, slide please Kat. So for staff's roles and responsibilities, it's really ensure that, that staff do understand um, this quite clearly. They can't rely on um, a filtering or monitoring system will keep children safe, as we saw in the video that sometimes these systems um, can fail to work. So it's really important that staff, uh, you make staff aware who possibly are those vulnerable pupils um, online. Um, and we're aware that children with disabilities and those who are vulnerable are more likely to uh, be victims um, of uh, abuse and exploited um, online. Um, so they need to be more vigilant to the children when they're accessing devices within the classroom and the um, nursery environment. So that good classroom management. Staff can complete history checks on device, devices and actually look what have children been uh, looking at and checking that as well as there being the system in place. They need to keep up to date with what children are doing online. Um, so attending regular staff briefings or reading briefings that, that are available to, to staff from the designated lead. Um, so like Andy was saying before, making sure that safeguarding is always on your on your agenda to keep staff up to date with safeguarding issues. Staff should all have basic security um, cyber security training because we're aware that actually there is the fact that organisations um, are trying to target um, any um, organisations, uh, public hospitality, government, um, schools um, around um, putting uh, issues into their systems uh, and bringing them down. So we need to be aware of that uh, as well. How do you protect yourself uh, from financial fraud, but how do you um, protect your school as well online? Also, what do you need to do if you have got a concern about pupil, you are worried about them online or there's been an incident in your classroom? It's like any issue, it's a safeguarding issue, it needs to be reported. Also, all staff need to be aware of the mechanisms to report technical concerns. So if a staff witnesses um, that or suspects someone has accessed some unsuitable material, or that they've um, accessed that themselves, because sometimes it can be pop-ups by certain word words you put in can trigger that. Um, that it's um, restricting their teaching and learning. So if there's a certain site you've already always used and now the filtering system stopping you from using that again, it's working for your IT provider um, to take remove that block so you can use that teaching material. And again, if there's any things like abbreviations, misspellings that you've noticed that somehow they've got around the system again, it all needs to be reported back through um, a mechanism within your organisation. So then your IT provider can make sure those blocks are put in place or access to those systems that you need. So it, it's much, much wider for staff and, and really important you ensure they know their roles and responsibilities. So next slide, Kat. Thank you. So some of you might be sitting there wondering how you can do this test. Some of you I know from visiting your schools are already experts at this. 
Um, so there is a website that you can click on. We've put the link there at the bottom of this slide. Um, and basically the page looks exactly like it does there with you know the green trees in the background. So you can test your internet filter. What we would advise is that you ask your IT technician to set up a, a staff test login and a child test login. So you're not testing um, against your login when you log into your computer or a child's login. So if you ask them to, to, to sort of set up a test one. Now, in keeping children safe, it says at least annually. Um, a lot of schools that we support, we're advising if they're going down the first of the month checks, then to do it then every month or every half term is fine. Um, and basically what you do is you, you log in as the test child or the test adult. You click on schools. If you can see the boxes at the top there, you type in the name of your school in your postcode, select your filtering provider, and then you run the filtering test. And it, it tests against um, child abuse, terrorism, adult content and offensive language. Now, you should be getting four green circles with four um, with a white stick in each circle. That shows that your filtering is working. Some schools we go in sometimes is an exclamation mark in a red circle that comes up underneath one of those. Um, so we would advise in that situation you contact your IT provider and say that the filtering isn't working for offensive language or whatever that might be. We would also advise that you do a screenshot and save those. So I was in a school yesterday and she did that. We did that together. So she did a screenshot um, of a child login and herself as, as the staff member and just to keep a file with those in so you've got that evidence trail. We would always advise that you do it with somebody else, whether that's your safeguarding governor when they come in or whether it's your DDSL um, and then and do it together. Um, so I think that's everything regarding that. So if there's any more questions, please pop them in the chat. Thank you. Um, this next slide is sort of a bit of advice, really, because often we get sort of asked questions regarding um, doing that test. Um, so we've sort of we, we liaise quite a lot with Smoothwall and they're really helpful. They always come back quite quickly with advice. So I've just sort of put some pointers here of you know exactly what they've said when doing your testing. So like I said, they're testing while you're logged in as a test student or teacher. Um, it will work on all devices. However, however, if users don't log into a device, for example, iPads, then all filtering should default to student level anyway. But I think what they are saying is if you have, say, a, a set of iPads or a set of Chromebooks or a set of um, laptops, whatever you use, they say it's, it's, it's good practice to actually maybe test on each device. Um, just to make sure that actually the filtering is working on all your iPads. You only have to test on one iPad. You can test on all of them. It depends. It depends how many iPads you've got, really, how big your school is. But, you know, they advise that you can just test on one iPad, one Chromebook, one laptop, um, and then the, you should get a good sort of outcome there to show whether the filtering is actually working or not. And like anything, if the filtering isn't working, then obviously you would report that to your IT provider straight away. Um, and then they also advise that it would be good practice to check on a device off the network as well. So if, for example, if you have a particular device that's going home with a with a child, a student or a, a staff member, then you're checking those. So it's working. The filtering is working when you're not on the school network as well. So that's just a bit of advice there around Smoothwall um, and the advice that they've sort of given us when we've asked those questions. Thank you. So standard three is, is blocking harmful and inappropriate content. Um, so you've got to ensure that you have an active and well-maintained filtering system. So like Kelly said, part of that is testing that. Um, so you need to ensure that it is blocking that harmful um, access, um, but no systems 100%. So that's why you need to make sure that you've got the other monitoring um, systems in place and staff management. A uh, good analogy from uh, Smooth Wall to share, really, if you haven't heard about it, is that they refer to your filtering system as a, the school fence. It's there to hopefully keep people out uh, and protect the children, but there's gaps people can climb over. And that's with your filtering system. Things can get through. No filtering system is 100% effective. 
So it's really important that you do have a, those other safeguarding systems in place um, and your monitoring part of your system, which some of these settings may have, is like your staff in the playground or in the classroom uh, around watching um, pupils behaviour. If you're preschools, you don't have to have a monitoring system because you might only have a, a number of iPads for children to use um, to make sure you've had a fil got correct filtering system in place, then the monitoring part will be done with your staff, where schools uh, may have a monitoring system that when children are actually typing in um, on the keyboard into um, apps, into Word documents, it will pick up uh, keywords and phrases and then send alerts to your designated lead. So that's that's the difference. So, you know, talk to your IT um, systems to, uh, person to make sure you've got what in place for your need. So lastly, really, it's just about, um, if you move on to the next slide, Kat, Kat um, it's about effective monitoring set, set strategies in your settings. It's the designated lead has the overall responsibilities to ensure that children are safe online while in school, but it is everybody's responsibilities. Governors need to have that oversight. They need to challenge, they need to check things are in place. You need to report to them any monitoring and filtering issues within your head teachers report or safeguardings report. Staff need to know their roles and responsibilities and where and when to report things. Uh, staff, parents and pupils, again, uh, need to have education to keep them up to date with what children are doing online um, so they've got that awareness. Um, the designated lead and senior management team and IT provider need to be monitoring that filtering system to make sure it is kept effective and your IT provider is there to support you within that. So like I said before, it's that whole school approach. So your next actions really are is to check that your, you've got a filtering system in, in place. Use the test um, that Kelly shared. We've put it in the chat as well. Ensure that your governor's staff are up to date with their role's responsibility to keep children safe online and make sure that staff access um, that additional training, safeguarding briefings at staff meetings around what children are doing online um, to give that awareness. So um, that does help them identify issues to hopefully keep them safe while in school. So thank you very much for listening to us uh, and I've answered um, there's a question in chat so I've, I've answered that. Thank you so much um, Joanna and Kelly. Are there any further questions um, while we've got them on the call? If not please do pop them in the chat and like I say I'll collate them at the end. Okay. So last section um, of this morning session, um, I'm going to be sharing with you some learning from some serious case reviews. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, safeguarding practice reviews can be commissioned um, by a local authority when there is um, any case where it suspects that there can be um, learning to improve practice. Often there can be a, um, a case linked to a tragic death or a near miss. Um, and I think it's really important that um, as a partnership, we share regularly these um, serious case reviews, particularly from a North Yorkshire point of view. But we will also highlight any national ones that have um, specific learning that you can be taking on as DSLs. So the first one that I just wanted to share with you, um, the other thing just to share, sorry, is that we will be incorporating this as a standing agenda item now on all of our DSL conferences in terms of these, the learning from these cases. But the first one um, I wanted to share with you is in relation to child M. Now I've popped the seven point briefing document in the chat so you can kind of have a look at that at your leisure. Um, but the case highlights the importance of governing bodies of schools seeking and following appropriate advice in relation to safeguarding children. So in this case, governors were made aware of concerns regarding the conduct of a, of a head teacher. In the process of the investigations, information um, about the final outcomes of the process were not shared with LADO. So the governing body, and um, there's quite a long story around this case, but ultimately um, the allegations were proved to be unfounded by the school and the governing body. But this process was not shared with the LADO, um, particularly poignant based on um, the information that Andy shared with us earlier. Now, several years later, um, the child that there was concerns around who was having um, 
inappropriate kind of uh, interactions with this head teacher, disclosed abuse that had taken a place taking place during this time. Um, now, we would ask that you read this report and share the learning, um, particularly in relation to your governing body, because there are some really key learning points that have come through in terms of the work of the governing body here. So a couple of the kind of the learning headlines that came out of this review. The learning highlights the importance of communicating and working with both sets of parents. So in this case, we had concerns raised by one parent and another parent who was saying that they weren't feeling particularly concerned with um, this child's relationship with the head teacher. So we had a parental conflict around that level of concern um, and this wasn't necessarily explored. Again, a key one is in relation to the responsibilities of the governing body and understanding their safeguarding responsibilities and that they have clear processes in place to manage these concerns and report them accurately. Whistleblowing in this case, um, again, we had members of staff who were raising concerns. And again, as Andy mentioned, do it, you know, several low level concerns, whereas if that information had been amalgamated would have created a much clearer picture. Um, so with regards to whistleblowing, it's ensuring that all school staff have the confidence to raise concerns regarding any member of school staff, including her teachers, including the leadership team, sorry. We need, they need to be confident in how to follow whistleblowing procedures when required, and there needs to be clear mechanisms in place when staff can share concerns without being blocked by a member of the senior leadership team. And then finally, with regards to professional curiosity and challenge, this has come up a few times in our conversations this morning. I've already mentioned um, this is mentioned quite heavily in new working together. Um, but it's in relation to that professional curiosity and challenge for all members of staff. Um, including the governing body. So again, we've got lots of information and resources around professional curiosity and challenge. I popped a QR code on an earlier slide, but it's just something to share in relation to all your staff teams and governing body. And then finally, for this case, in relation to disciplinary procedures. So when restrictions are placed on a member of school staff, there needs to be clear mechanisms in place through which these are monitored and clear advice for the steps that need, needs taking if the restrictions are breached. Um, if a governing body is provided with, an, with advice by um, NYC services through the ladder or from the HR department and there is a decision not to adopt or to deviate from the advice, this should be risk assessed and the outcome of the assessment should be shared with North Yorkshire. Um, so whoever provided that advice, if you're deciding to not follow that advice, that risk assessment needs to be shared back with them about the decisions that have been made. So again, like I say, this this is a really this is local. This is a case that I think is really prominent that um, has some really key elements of learning to share. I just wanted to share with you um, a couple of national cases, really, because I think there's some really interesting points of learning for schools here. Um, so again, just the headlines for these ones, but um, I think they're particularly interesting. So. This one is a one in relation to the sad death of a seven year old child in Bradford who died in 2020 after being struck by a car. Now, at the time, there was no one at the home address caring for him and his two siblings. Now, this is a quite a wordy slide, but um, some key elements of learning and I'll just give you the headlines. It's particularly insightful to hear the voice of the sibling in this report. Um, the sibling shares that there was quite high levels of manipulation by the mother um, and threats that they the children would be split up, the siblings would be split up and taken into care if they were to share with professionals what was going on at home. So if they were saying that mum was leaving them on their own. Um, she said she would often go into school needing food, being hungry, perhaps looking a little bit unkempt or dishevelled um, as they've been left on their own for whole weekends. School weren't picking up on these signs because mum would always be visible at school pickups and drop offs. So at those times when professional eyes were on her, um, she was making herself quite visible. When concerns were raised to the mother, she always had an explanation of what her children were saying and could kind of answer those concerns quite coherently. Um, 
And the point of learning here is the professionals only really listen to the voice of the mother. Um, and while the child's verbal voice may have been listened to, you know, they, they've asked what's going on at home, um, it was clear that the child was being controlled. And what they were saying verbally was not what was being displayed in their behaviours and actions. And this form of non-verbal behaviour and, and communication was not explored. Um, so we're just kind of going on what the children are saying as, as read as what's going on. Um, so again, it's that level of professional curiosity in this one. Another national case for you to have a look at, um, this time from Luton, where we had a very um, sad and fatal stabbing of a boy in June 2021. Now, in the months leading to his death, there were a series of exclusions, assaults and gang associations that were known about by professionals. The findings highlight um, the need for early identification in relation to risk particularly in relation to primary school children and the transition to secondary school. It highlights that importance of early effective intervention. Um, it shares about recognising and disentangling the complex cultural and relational dynamics to gain a better understanding of the lived experience of a child. It's about identifying additional educational needs at the earliest opportunity, giving the child the greatest opportunity to maximise their education and improve likelihood of better outcomes. And consideration of the use of exclusion of pupils, particularly when there are risks of harm outside the home and how this can be balanced appropriately with keeping children safe. Um, interestingly as well, the family also shared that they felt that there was not enough done by police and schools to respond to that level of harm um, in the surrounding school environment. So again, just some really key headlines, but, th you know, food for thought really in terms of how we can kind of share that learning um, right across the school teams. Um, while we're still on training and learning, a reminder to partners that you can access all of our procedures, practice guidance and one minute guides on our website. And I've added some QR codes onto there for your convenience. Um, we know it's hard to hold all the safeguarding information and we know we've given you a lot of information today. But the takeaway is um, to remember that the website is there to help you. So if you, you are looking for information around a particular theme, there will be a one minute guide or a piece of practice guidance there to kind of refresh your knowledge or that you can share. Um, I've added links to the, <clears throat> the training page where you can access information about all our upcoming training courses available to partners. So Andy's already touched on um, <clears throat> our next partnership masterclasses tomorrow, and he will be going into a little bit more detail around the Lado and some more specific um, learning from cases. March, um, our masterclass will be held on the 20th, um, which will be run by me. And I'm excited that that will be a focus on our new multi-agency child exploitation strategy. And we'll be launching that to coincide with Child Exploitation Awareness Day on the 18th of March. Now, please keep a lookout. Um, I'm in the process of developing um, a programme of learning for that week as well to really raise awareness around child exploitation. So we're going to have a series of additional masterclasses that week, um, all around different themes covering child exploitation. Um, so really excited to share that with you. We'll also be releasing the dates for our um, multi-agency child exploitation face-to-face -face development sessions which we'll hold at the end of June um, so that will all be um, released as part of a pack and um, some of you who came last year hopefully there's a few of you who came last year we had lots of amazing feedback for those face-to-face -face sessions so we'd love to see more representation from school in the summer sessions our April masterclass will see the launch of a new um, and exciting campaign called um, hashtag ask me have the conversation. Um, now, this is looking at a collation of information and resources for all of our partners to continue to have safe, safe sleep conversations with new and expectant parents. Um, so we'll be looking at um, a, ser a social media campaign and a series of kind of um, images and deliverables, but the, the, the main focus is a collation of key resources so partners can have those really open and honest and non-blaming conversations with parents and expecting parents around those safe sleeping arrangements. 
Our May masterclass will see an update from North Yorkshire Police looking at counter-terrorism. And in June, we will hold a ma masterclass um, held by our voluntary community and social enterprise partners um, to coincide with Volunteer Week, but will be open to all partners. And it's all around kind of sharing those key safeguarding messages in the VCSE community. A reminder to you all that our masterclasses are recorded and available on our YouTube channel so you can watch those back, you can share them with your staff teams or with your governors, you can use them as part of your training schedule. Um, and we are in the process of looking at our masterclass schedule um, as we move into the la latter half of the year, sort of July to December. So again, if as DSLs you are identifying a gap or a particular area of learning that you would like us to cover, please get in touch with me and we will endeavour to kind of get as much information and get a session on for you as soon as we can. <clears throat> And again, a final reminder to partners of all our key links, including our social media channels, our YouTube page. Um, I will record this, put the recording of this on the YouTube. It'll be on in the next day or two. Um, and again, a QR code so you can scan to sign up to our monthly e-bulletin. So we share a lot of key safeguarding updates with partners through that. So, for example, those of you who aren't signed up January and February, we, we did a particular focus on some key elements of online safety. Um, especially since I read a lot of young people who may have um, received new devices over the Christmas period. So often I'll get a lot of feedback from DSL saying that they, they will pull out particular sections and say this will be a really nice bit to put in our school newsletter for parents around setting up new devices or a particular emerging risk or concern. Um, so please do subscribe, please do give us a follow on our social media. Um, again, if, if we're sort of promoting campaign materials, please share them, share them on your own social media channels and then we can get them um, as far and wide as possible. Um, but that is the end of today's session. I think you've, you've got a whole 15 minutes back to um, enjoy at your leisure. But we've got the partners still around the virtual table. So please, if there are any questions, use this opportunity. Um, and if not, you can enjoy your 15 minutes of free time. Thank you very much.